What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Douglas Breitbart, and we have a conversation about the possibility of co-creating sustainable organizational change beyond the organization. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, lean back to be inspired and maybe even surprised. Douglas, welcome to the show. Thank you, Miriam. We haven't so, even decided on a topic. This is true. Trusting that the conversation will lead us where it has to lead us. So we'll start with the same old question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? I actually don't. <laughs> like 90% of my podcast guests. <laughs> like, is that true? Like most yes, of us? I think so. Um, yeah, I've actually like spent no small amount of time with a colleague of mine drilling into like the power of certain terms usually comes up within the leadership meme, but I have this belief or superstition that a lot of people are culturally set up, imprinted, trained, habituated to somebody with some attribution of authority on appearance like the minute that person is named and or designated, that there is an instantaneous, autonomic, complete reconfiguration of the person sitting facing that person, and they shift into, I'm no longer driving. Some of it conscious, a lot of it not, but I'm no longer driving and I am no longer responsible, Whew, thank God, and I now can wait for instruction. And <laughs> is this a bad thing? And let me explain what I mean by that. Sure. I think if we're getting a group or an individual to land in the space and trust enough to give up the responsibility of driving or leading and can just be and bring in the best version of themselves to the space, isn't this a good thing or an aspirable thing? So let me unpack, because in the question, there's actually like several moving parts. And for me, unpacking them is really important because there's a key ingredient that The question is whether that ingredient is needed or not. Like, could you choose to just not invite that to the party? So I'm hugely, you know, devoted to inviting people into the space, sort of as a space holder, but also as a creator and doing that in a way so that there is safety and there's openness and there's invitation and that that's actually like the best part. Like mm -hmm. that's regardless of what the it is, regardless of what the agenda or the learning or the training, whatever what happens. <laughs> like if, because if somebody can be in that state, then they're in feeling. And if they're in feeling and connection, they're in learning. Like, That's where the learning happens, and or at least the biggest learning can happen. And once somebody undergoes that sort of autonomic shift into you lead, I'm following, there are whole systems that are sort of switched off. Mm -hmm. They're like taken offline almost. And if I can avoid triggering that, There's much less work having them arrive, like having them be present, be in the moment. And we actually, in 2B Elemental, 
which is one of the one of the, there are three companies that are sort of you know a, they comprise a whole. But in TV Elemental, we have a ritual, uh, sort of an opening ritual that is very much designed as an invitation. It's like I'm going to exhale and let go of this, and I'm going to inhale and invite that. And by the end, it is we in unison. We are present in emergence, breathing here, like clear. And that's not led. You know, the person who's reading the prompts isn't characterized as a leader or titled, or there's no attachment of role at all. So the unpacking is, if I have the title, it's usually a small stone's throw for, and I am responsible mm. in a results-oriented way or in a delivery-oriented, performance-oriented way, or a dozen different things that are act energetically active in that. And it also, there's a vesting in the result. There's an attachment to the result. So that's putting me in a position where a certain percentage of my being 100% present and receiving is actually diverted to that, which is internal and about me and has nothing to do with the people I'm in service to, <laughs> right? For the people that have switched and go, okay, tell me where to go and what to do and how and whatever, that's also like comfort zone in the working world out there. But I'm actually like interested in catalyzing them stepping into and owning 100% of their generative contribution, potential engagement. And I don't have a horse in the race of where they go with that, what they do with that, what it turns into, because I also don't have a projection of what I'm trying to achieve or where I'm trying mm -hmm. to take them, or I'm not coming at it from that place. It's like a completely different orientation. And I don't have any judgments, coaching, facilitating, moderating, <laughs> hosting. Like, I don't, it's not that I judge any of those things or am in opposition to the forms, but I'm really drawn to like, how do we do this differently? How can we do that better from the standpoint of, for enabling more people to each individually fully come into the present, contribute with voice, agency, creativity, like with all of themselves, and have the container defined as loosely as humanly possible, as minimally as humanly possible to enable that. So the space is there. And I'm actually not feeding that comfort zone thing of where's the leader? Who's going to give me directions? Mm. Who's going to tell me how to do what to do or what's expected? Or <laughs> So I'm an outlier a little like, I'm, you know, I'm coming from a slightly different orientation. Well, I, I hear the, some basic concepts and I, like responsibility, like attachment, like neutrality. So what I hear is everyone is responsible for the outcomes and what is happening in the space that you're holding. And it reminds me of a concept that I read in a book, The Big Leap, that in a relationship, both parts are 100% responsible for the outcomes. It's not shared responsibility where it's 50-50 or 40-60 right. <laughs> or 80-20. No, it's everyone has 100% responsibility. And I think however you want to call that person and a facilitator, a guide, a space holder, a host, a mentor, a moderator, also has some responsibility. And this connects to another thing that you said where I heard neutrality, that you're not attached to the outcome because it's not about you. So maybe it's less about the label, how do you call yourself, and more about the role of keeping the space open and safe enough. Yeah, and any attachment I have coming in the door 
outcome, result, you know, metric, whatever. But any attachment I walk in with is a cut down and constraint and limitation on what's possible. So how do you deal with situations where you're invited into the space to do your magic? <laughs> let's not call it facilitation. Let's call it magic. And the person who's inviting you has some idea of a tangible outcome. It might be an outcome, it might be an output, but there is an expectation. Understood. By definition. And then you sense into the space, and maybe those who are in the space, and after what you're describing, I almost don't want to call them participants, but contributors. Co-creators. Co-creators. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. They might have a different intention, need, or desire. To whom of the two would you be loyal to? It's an and and both. And I would suggest that's the difference. That's the difference that there's client, there's agenda, train, or transformation, or this or that, or whatever. There's a participant group or target group of whatever who are going to be on the receiving end of whatever. Like that's the traditional starting place. That's the frame. My orientational shift is an and, which says whatever your goal is, your agenda, your output or, or attachment, let's really drill down and make sure we're both clear on how you want that to affect or be energized by these people leaving the room after. And when you ask those questions, all of a sudden, the stated goal and agenda for this is the training and this is what the da, 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 expands a bit. Because it's one thing to stand up there in 1800 style and just dump. And it's another thing to engage in a learning journey where the people walk out not just having assimilated information or knowledge, but have actually connected with and internalized what value that's serving, what contribution that's making, what its intended effect is on an experiential and lived basis in whatever the working context is. So it's a leveling up of, you, you know, you want to go through the motions, but everybody walks out and it's like, thank God that one's over and I can get back to work until the next one. <laughs> because none of these things ever really affect or change my responsibilities and deliverables to my, the person I report to and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, do you really you know, is this really intended? And if you really want this to be successful on a lived internalized basis, then let's look at what the it is, make sure you've got a, a very clear picture of what are you asking for? Mm. Okay. Then the second piece of the puzzle and the enrollment part, it's not a you're coming or it's not a do you want to come and we're doing this at 11 o'clock on Tuesday. The people that you are looking to serve with this need to be enrolled. And that enrollment actually starts with the design of when, where, how you design the invitation, how you design the language you use, the articulation you use, how you set up the signaling to increase the chances of getting attention, driving action, and inquiry so that they're already engaged before they've walked in the room. So the whole invitation piece for most is like when and where. Tell me when and where I have to show up. Mm -hmm. If you add the, the experiential and lift dimension of, I want to pull them to this. I want them attracted to this. How, what's required to do that? What's the language to use? What's the, the setup of that to communicate in, a, in language and context in a way that the human beings on the receiving end 
respond and resonate. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's um, it's definitely a part that many neglect that the actual work for the facilitator, let me call this person facilitator. Sure, sure. <laughs> happens before the workshop happens. And I would be curious what your process is. How much research do you do? How much do you then need to know about those who enter the space? Or do you rely on the client? Because how much do they actually know and understand? The client has whatever they have. That's part of that inquiry of what's your ask of this mm -hmm. event and this whatever it is you're looking to transmit. Digging into that also covers for who, for what purpose. And that gets you to defining who's the demographic. And do you know where to find those people or do you need to inquire into to identify where those people are for purposes of then inviting them? So adding those sort of connective tissue dimensions, if I am having a party and I want you to come, it's not just sort of filling out an invitation and putting a stamp on it. Mm -hmm. If I really want you to be there, Like with bells on, not groan, oh no, I've got to do this. But because you have been given the care and attention, you've been given the energy investment. And all of these pieces are inquiry driven, co created with the client from the very beginning of the process. And what I love about what you're saying is that every participant has a very gets a individual and heartfelt invitation to come to the space. And hence, this cancels out everything that is related to participants are not engaged. Participants are disrupting with questions, why are we discussing about this anyway? And it also helps the client to then really identify because you cannot speak out this heartfelt invitation if you're not actually very clear about their role and their... <laughs> the possibility of their contribution that you see in them. They might not see it, but you can. And like, if you relate to them as part of a mechanical industrial process, rather than as human beings, then 80% of all of the activities are going through the motions and everybody endures being put through them And they are all usually work plus, cost plus on top of my regular obligations, which I am very clear of and I know what I have to do. And you're adding this mm. to the pile, but it's not connected. It's not integrated. And if the client has identified, is clear about the ask, but you take that clarity to a whole different level, who, for, what, when, And what's the value add? And what's the opportunity also for that value add? And for the person you're inviting to this to up their vested connection and sense of value and importance to the whole. So all of those things are operating every minute of every day in connection with everything. And if that dimension of human beings doing together is not part of the deal, then you're leaving huge generative potential on the table and you're ignoring the sort of most powerful energetic potential that exists in your people, not as resources, but in your, mm -hmm. your, the people that comprise your organization. So it's doing And it's not talking about this. It's actually living a different heightened orientation, raising the bar a bit. Yes. And this leads me to another question, which is maybe a little bit of a hen and an egg problem. Okay. From what I hear is that you're actually expecting a quite high level of maturity from the clients because the reality that I see and sense is usually 
we need a workshop because we have this problem, this change process, this decision that has been made. And now we are running late. So we need to get the people onto the room in order to usually push something. Absolutely. Absolutely. The moment where a client is willing to basically slow down and go through the process of the why, the what, the when, the who, the how, and the bigger impact, the bigger value, actually already means that they are in a state that will, by definition, promise better outcomes. It's self-fulfilling. And I do think that it's also for us facilitators, it's a kind of responsibility to then turn these clients down if they haven't gone through this process and if they want to push too fast and too quick and treat their people as resources. Well, that's sort of an individual choice. I don't have any projections or judgments about that, right? But I've said to a, you know, co-head of HR, you know, 220,000 global employees, you know, you asked about, and this was a particular context. So the person said, and we were talking to them about a whole, a whole other engagement. And the person says, do you guys do cognitive diversity? That was a, you know, one of those new shiny things that popped up and hit the radar, right? Do you do cognitive diversity? And I said to him, and it was in an email, and I said, we, it sort of requires a little conversation. And he responded immediately. And so we get, in this, we get in a call. And I said to him, so here's why I'm putting you through like this time instead of just responding yes or no. Now, if your question is, where can I go get me some cognitive diversity? Because my boss on the golf course this last weekend was told about it by his friend, the CEO of his companion, you know, his companion. And like, you know, they're getting it. So we need to get it. We're not your people. And if that's the marching orders, here's the name of the person who's the top thought leader in cognitive diversity as a noun. And here's the top, you know, consulting firm that provides cognitive diversity as a commodity. How did you reply? He said, no, we're, we're not. This is like genuine. And I said, well, then, yeah, we can absolutely go there. But it's actually a, a much deeper well and dive. And it would start with having a conversation and unpacking and drilling down into all of the moving parts and dimensions of what cognitive diversity as a living verb oriented thing is means, you know, what, what makes it up. And starting from there and then co evaluating, creating, designing the version that melds all of that meat and potatoes with your particular context, company, case, people, circumstance. And I know I and mine are not the right tool people for the commodity version. Like we're not in the selling things business. <laughs> we're in the, you know, affecting transformative and evolutionary living change and and growth and and enrichment so that's a very different bar and what does it take then to really create the space where transformation the real change can happen because change and transformation are very often just labels sure and they go into a bureaucratic nightmare with change process. And let's be honest, nobody likes change that is put upon us. Right. We yeah. all love change that we decide for ourselves that the change we love. Well, I, you know, rule number one is that true transformation has to be created whole cloth by the people that are going to be embodying it, manifesting it, bringing it every morning. Like if they're not part of the build and the design, if they're not part of the response to the question of 
what it's responding to from a need standpoint, then they're not vested and there isn't a basis to expect contribution to and maintenance of the energy and the commitment and the orientation to upholding it, to being in alignment with whatever the new is. And 85, 90% of these initiatives don't work and don't sustain and don't happen because they always start from a root of projection, power, control, authority over and position. Even though they can, there's a lot of verbiage today that makes it sound like it's not that, but it's that. It's like, you know, greenwashing stuff. You scratch the surface and it's like, you know, planting 50,000 acres of fast growth pine or palm is not reforestation. It's the lumber industry painted with a green brush. Like, no. But conversely, if you call the question, like real deal or commodity, go through the motions, there is intrinsic in that a sort of obvious, clear, like if instead of what you usually get, it looked like this, and you literally had a self-energizing, self-propagating transformation process that's viral and that's energized and that's really affecting your people. And they're coming in the morning as owners of, promoters of, believers in on a whole being basis, on an emotional basis, on a spiritual basis, not just their work, not just intellectual, not just demand. Wouldn't that be better than you having to check and make sure that everybody's living up to your the expectation you're imposing? And how do you approach that? Because it's a complex system. It's a complex project that very often turns into complicated processes. <laughs> so how can you simplify the complexity? Because this is what we then need, because as soon as we have processes and directives and bureaucracy. And You're gone. <laughs> and when you say that, of course, it's like I'm nodding. Yes, 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 of course. But what does it take? Maybe what are the three ingredients that would actually facilitate this sustainable change, this genuine change? So this is what we figured out. Now, have we had like real robust whole organization runtime opportunity to, to run it up the flagpole yet? No, we're getting closer. And companies are converging with recognizing the need and or being open to because of the fear that they're experiencing with a world that's just falling apart and no roadmaps. So C-suites today are not fun places. And the more terrified they are, Through my lens, the more in fear they are, which is feeling, the more open and in learning they potentially are. And this is the moment to get the nose in the tent to really try walking on the wild side. But the, the, the truth is the actual transformative energy and phenomena starts with the negotiate the selling into and negotiation of the terms of the of the retainer of our services and what would be the check boxes of the red flags so the check boxes are that in the course of going through you know long sales our target is really big companies we have small ones and we know the moving parts work The, we're really going after the big ones because if you can transform one of them, the ability to really affect transformative change quickly on a global basis, like they're the most powerful potentials. So in the process of selling into, to use old paradigm language, it's an enrollment process and it's a calling the question. So working up to the decision maker and then starting with the decision maker, the terms are, we're going to catalyze a transformation program process, whatever. We are not coming with one. 
So we're not selling things. We don't have a black box. We don't have a brand in anything. We don't have card decks. We don't have forms. We don't have, you know, it's not a pill. We're not, we have no magic pills. However, that program will be co-created and developed by your people using your pre-existing internal resources, 100%. So that's the first frame and constraint. So this isn't about buying things, big capital expense. It's also not about an army of us. Like if you need more of us to catalyze and hold space and, and shepherd, then you know we'll train your internal people to become that. But it's all on you, baby. It's like, <laughs> this, is, this is an internal, completely internal agenda. So that's number one. Number two, the initial team that will be charged with infecting the organ, will catalyzing the organization in this process, which is, we see it as a viral thing, infecting it. Mm -hmm. That team is going to be voluntary and drawn from all of the moving parts of the of the company. And they need to be given written contractual security in their job, in their job progression in terms of benefits, accrual of benefits and seniority and all of that stuff. They, they have to be 100% secure if they volunteer that they are not in jeopardy and lose nothing, that they're volunteering would be taking away from them in the security of knowing what their current track and position and department is. So you're creating a shield of security for them so that e they can dare to challenge. And that's in writing. And mm. that's in writing. Brilliant. That's in writing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's the safety piece. That doesn't mean that group isn't going to have to go through Foreman, Storm, and Norman, <laughs> all part of it, but they're secure to do that, to jump off that cliff. So that's one piece. The other piece is this initiative has to carry the weight of the C-suite prioritization and importance. So whenever they need, whatever they need, they get it. Remember, we're constrained to internal resources, but if they need something from from IT, they're going to get. If they need something from HR, they're going to get. If they need something from sales, they're going to get. Whatever they need, they get with priority. So that means in this process of hiring us, the buyer needs to identify the key senior executives over the key moving machinery parts of the min and back office for us to establish that and confirm with those people that They're on board. They need to be enrolled, not told. So that's transformation. They've never had that experience before. They get a memo that says, this person asked for something, you're going to give them priority within this budget range and this budget. Everything's projected. No. They need to understand This is a blank check being given to an as yet unidentified, undesignated group of people internal to the company. And we have no idea what they're going to ask for specifically, but if they ask for it and need it, you're going to figure out how to make that happen. Uncertainty, the biggest enemy of a leadership team. Boom. Um. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a formalization of that process that they actually get to be enrolled, but they also get to co-create the machinery and mechanism for dealing with this as something else. We haven't even gotten to the point of being hired yet. <laughs> I wonder why. Right? So it's not a silver bullet kind of magic stick where is, you come in like, with an army of people and transform. This is, this is doing it. And then the third piece is mm -hmm. that the team once enrolled reports to nobody. Their only accountability is internal to each other. It requires a level of trust to, and it's my um, behavioral science um, <laughs> background just jumps in. It requires a trust in the organization that they actually do have the resources and everything it needs. 
it requires trust into that team that basically they provided this safety security shield, as you described, and had then a blanco check, not to report to anyone, but to themselves. And what it reminds me of, I'm provoking, is the experiment that has been repeated several times about with the prisoners and the guards, where random people were assigned to be either prisoners or guards. And although everyone knew that these prisoners didn't commit any criminal action, the guards were abusing their power the moment they Absolutely. put into the position of it. And <laughs> just the probability, the slightest doubt that human beings are driven by self-motivation, intrinsic belief or hope for the best possible outcome for the organization, that's a big ask to a leadership team. Well, for the leadership team, the ask is actually for them to let go of their addiction to authority, power, control. It's saying to them, you're not driving this. This is sourced and the, the fire energy for this transformation initiative is from the people that are charged with responsibility for it. You are not controlling it. And if it goes wrong, it's their head that is rolling. Well, yes and no. Like, what's the downside risk, really? Now, on the other side, the, the experiment that you pointed to, and this is distinction on the case, the point of that experiment was it is the poster child for everything that's wrong with the paradigm of power and control and authority over. Mm -hmm. And not with. And not with. And between the screening of candidates, the invitation to those people. Mm, thank you. And, and the enrollment process of them, there is no aspect of what they're stepping into that has any dimension of power, control, authority, or projection thereof in what they're about to do. So it's, <laughs> it's based on the, yeah, and thank you for making this distinction, because I think it is indeed also a human trait that once we are trusted genuinely, we usually tend to hold that closely and to live up to the standards, unless we're a psychopath. <laughs> correct, correct. But if I don't have anybody to report to but myself mm. and, my, and, and my teammates, then the forming, storming, norming process is where we would be catalyzing in them their own transformation into emergent creation, co-creation. And so literally, if you, if you tr follow the breadcrumbs, every step from first contact forward is in fact demanding of client transformation or agreement to what's needed for transformation to be enabled. Doesn't mean it's guaranteed or is, is, is even defined in terms of what it looks like because that team's first task is in the charge of minimally, what's the first thing mm. to do? And, and we, we have one, if, if by the time of their enrollment, they haven't evolved that themselves, we have a starting place that could work pretty effectively without being projective. And it revolves around values, organizational values, but it activates and energizes and drives like massive rewiring. And, and it requires creating a nervous system in an organization to to take it on. And as you're referring to values, if an organization has strong values that are lived throughout the organization, most probably they wouldn't need such a transformation. So if the values are just a label in the meeting rooms, then... Love I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our hook. Every major 
multinational company and organization in the world has a statement or multiple statements of their values, their mission, prominently displayed and featured. And so the first sort of undertaking that we start with is a values audit. So the first mission of the volunteers, should they decide to accept it, is to take an inventory of all explicit expressions of value, stated values of the organization, to research and gather the perceived values of the organization by the world outside and all stakeholders touched or affected by it, and the internal tacit experience of values that the people that comprise the organization actually are on the receiving end of. And in order to do that, by the time they're done, first of all, what's revealed is the delta, the gap between what they say their values are and what they are actually doing. Mm -hmm. Right? The second thing that is required is they have to figure out how to set up a means and mechanism so that every single employee in an organization is provided the means and the invitation to contribute to that process. If they have nothing to say, they have nothing to say, but to make it really clear that anything they have to share would be hugely valuable. Putting that mechanism in place is adding a whole bi-directional communication network for a purpose no organization in the world currently has, which is to actually hook up and connect and communicate with every single person in the organization between each other, between this team, and with the company at large. In a non-controlled, siloed, tailored way, free range. <laughs> <laughs> the the image just that came to my mind was the war by internal audit. <laughs> I think uh, you're creating a team that is stepping on many toes of the internal audit. Well, um, no, it's only, it's all invitation driven. Yes. It's inquiry driven. Yes. It's like coming from love. And the other question that I had was. How would you identify this court? I mean, I'm loving the idea and <laughs> hope you don't mind me just. Not at all. I, you know. Um, asking all these questions and challenging it. This team, this task force, as I imagine it, and you mentioned it, they must come from all different areas of the organization so that it's representative, needs to be diverse. They need to be well connected, I guess. So you have to identify people who already have their social networks. Their and social the alphas. Their social alphas. Yeah, ideally, not required though, because certain business, you know, certain roles and departments and divisions, like they're not social, and and there has to be representation of those people too. Like, who's your engineer guy? <laughs> and how do you and how do you define social? Because Of course, we tend to think, oh, these are the sociable people who have lunch with lots of different people and who are always invited to all the outings. And then there are the more introverted ones that might not talk so much, but they are those who are very aware of all the information because they listen. But they have all the information, they listen, and they're of influence and respect. Yes. Because, because, because you can because have people, they listen. <laughs> you, you can have people that are, you know, airy people that are, you know, very much masters of the data, masters of the moving parts, masters of who don't also have the balance of water, of empathy, and the balance of space and inviting room and inviting contribution and question. And mm. so it's the more important sort of attribute of the folks that you're screening for people that are really elementally balanced, like 
as people, as human beings. Hello, listener. Are you tired of listening to my podcast voice praising our sponsor Session Lab in each episode? I think it's time to pass the mic over to you. So if you are as much of a Session Lab fan and user as I am, please share your experience and praise and don't be shy of adding a sentence of self-promo. Send me your soundbite and you might hear yourself on the next show and find your name and URL in the show notes. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.